November 24th, 2009. When her rescue pager went off shortly after 9 p.m., caver Susie Matola, one of the search and rescue volunteers, rushed to Nutty Putty Cave and descended into the cave through a rocky hole on top of a large hill in the West Desert, together with two other rescuers. At around 12.30 a.m., she had reached 26-year-old John Edward Jones, who had been stuck upside down inside a narrow passage about the size of the opening of a closed dryer for more than three hours by then. Hi John, my name is Susie. How's it going? John's voice seemed to come from the other end of a long hallway when he said, Hi Susie, thanks for coming, but I really, really want to get out. Located in Utah, 55 miles from Salt Lake City, Nutty Putty Cave was first discovered in 1960 by caver Dale Green. He named it Nutty Putty because of the strangely viscous clay oozing found in most of the narrow tunnels in the underground structure. Like silly putty, the clay would change from a solid to an elastic fluid when lightly squeezed. With a total surveyed length and depth of 1355 and 145 feet, this hydrothermal cave quickly became famous for its notoriously narrow and slippery passageways, twists, turns and squeezes. The entrance, called Blowhole, for example, measures only 1.8 meters across and drops straight down from the surface to a depth of 4.6 meters. Richard Downey, the grotto's treasurer and historian, said that many Boy Scouts went in with flashlights and sandals only, because Nutty Putty was believed to be relatively easy due to some larger passages. About 5,000 people, in its heyday even up to 25,000 people, visited the not fully mapped cave each year. John Edward Jones entered Nutty Putty Cave at around 8 p.m. local time on the evening of Wednesday, November 24th, 2009, together with his 20-year-old brother, Josh, and nine other friends and family members. John, who was studying to become a pediatric cardiologist at the medical school in Virginia, where he lived with his pregnant wife Emily and their one-year-old daughter Lizzie, had come back home to Utah to spend holidays with his family. John was a spelunker, a person who explores and studies caves, known to navigate through the smallest of spaces during their explorations. He had plenty of caving experience, as his father frequently took him and Josh on caving trips all over Utah when they were kids. He also volunteered as a trapped victim for Utah Cave Rescue, an organization founded by his father. Even though he was taller than most cavers, he was whip thin and seemingly had the perfect stature for spelunking. But by the time he entered Nutty Putty Cave, it had been years since he was in any cave. About an hour into exploring the largest room in the cave, named Big Slide, John and Josh, as well as two of their friends, decided to find the Nutty Putty Cave formation known as the Birth Kennel, a tight and challenging passageway that eventually opens up into a larger room. After splitting up, John had found that what he thought was the Birth Kennel. Head first, he inched his way into the narrow 135-foot-long tunnel, using his hips and fingers, thinking the tunnel would get wider at the bottom. But instead of coming to an end, the passage made a sharp downward turn. Within minutes, John was completely stuck in the unmet passage that was no wider than the opening of a washing machine. He was unable to turn around or wriggle his way back. In the hopes he could fit through the barely 10 by 18 inches wide space, he tried to exhale the air in his lungs. But when he inhaled again, he got stuck for good. One arm bent underneath his chest, the other forced backward. Now it is unclear from the conflicting sources whether John entered Birth Kennel and accidentally turned into an area called Scout Eater, or if he had missed the Birth Kennel entirely and crawled into Ed's push instead, that unlike Birth Kennel does not lead to a larger room, at least nowhere a 6 foot 200 pound man could fit. Either way, John kept pushing until he got trapped upside down, 100 feet below the ground, at a 70 degree angle. John's brother Josh was the first to find him. When Josh crab crawled through the muddy tunnels, he got stuck himself, but was able to see his brother in front of him. I quote, Seeing his feet and seeing how swallowed he was by the rock, that's when I knew it was serious, Josh said. He pulled at his brother's calves and was able to inch his body up a bit. But John had nothing to hold on to and slipped back into the crevice as soon as Josh released him. 
I had to get out, said Josh, crawled back to the surface and called 911. He knew time was running out. The downward angle at which John was trapped was putting great stress on his body, especially his heart, that now had to work against gravity, constantly pumping the blood out of his brain. Trauma physician Doc Murdoch, who arrived at the scene, explained that John's circulation would soon start to slow down and toxins would build up in his blood. If the rescuers were to free John, those toxins could rush to his heart and kill him. John might have 8 to 10 hours to live at the time. After calling 911, Josh crawled back into the cave to take the place of a friend who had stayed with John the whole time. Both brothers, devout Mormons, began to pray and when Josh heard the first rescuer Susan Matola arrive at the cave's entrance, John told him to leave. Susan did everything she could to help John, including cutting off his jeans to try to free up a few inches and helping string a rope from John's legs back to the rest of the rescue team in an open pit at the tunnel's entrance. When everything was ready, they started to pull as hard as they could, but suddenly one of the pulleys failed. The friction of the rope rubbing against stone was too strong. Two hours later, Susie crawled back out. In the meantime, the rescue team worked on solving the friction problem by setting up a rope pulley system anchored to the tunnel walls with a series of climbing cams, which are anchors designed to fit quickly and tightly into rock. They drilled the cams deep into the thick layer of powdery calcite that coated the cave walls and then string the rope through the attached pulleys. Over the next 24 hours, 137 rescuers tried to free John from the depths of the Nutty Putty Cave and only six of them were able to reach John through the narrow tunnel. Rescuers ordered six gallons of vegetable oil that should help slide John out and shortly considered using explosives, but came to realize neither would work. There was no back entrance to the tunnel where John was stuck either, and drilling through the rock in order to widen the passage took an hour and a half and yet was unsuccessful. When John's wife Emily arrived at the scene, Utah County Sheriff Lt. Tom Hodgson teared up when he remembered how two Boy Scouts nearly lost their lives in separate incidents back in 2004, who got trapped in the same area of Nutty Putty Cave as John, but were a few meters closer to the entrance of the passage. In one of the cases, rescue crews took 14 hours to free a 16-year-old Scout, who weighed 140 pounds and was 5 foot 7 tall, making him much smaller than John using a complex series of pulleys. After the second incident within the same week, officials closed Nutty Putty Cave in 2004. The cave had only been reopened for six months in 2009 when John and his family entered. After a cave management plan was signed with the Timpanogos Grotto that had set up an online reservation system that only allowed one group in the cave at a time. At night, the cave entrance was padlocked and shut. As the rescue team kept pulling John out, they realized that the angle of the passage meant they couldn't bend John's body backward without the likelihood of breaking his legs. In his weakened state, the shock could potentially kill him. Because the initially installed pulley system started to lose its anchor point in the powdery calcid cave walls, the rescue team rebuilt the system by drilling it into the rock. By this time, John had been trapped upside down for almost 12 hours. To keep him conscious, rescuer Ryan Schertz started talking to him about John's family. Salt Lake City County crews later managed to strung a two-way cable radio 400 feet from the entrance to John's position so he could talk to his wife, Emily. At around 4 p.m. on November 25th, 19 hours after John got stuck, a rope strung through nearly 15 tandem pulleys drilled into the cave wall. Rescuers finally had the power to pull John out. They worked in an eight-man tandem, all tugging as one. With each pull, John's body moved a little further until his feet painfully hit the low ceiling. They had to make frequent pauses to give John some rest. After about 20 minutes, they started pulling for the fourth time. Ryan's shirt started screaming and shortly blacked out. The stone arch near John's legs, where the rope was tied around, had broken because it couldn't bear the weight. A heavy metal carabina flew directly into Ryan's face, nearly cutting his tongue in half. He had to get out, and his father Dave Schertz took his place at John's side. 
He drilled two new holes and pushed the pulley into the second one, but eventually had to retreat to the surface due to exhaustion. Brandon Cavallis, another member of Utah Cave Rescue, had just arrived at Nadipati Cave. He crawled into the tunnel to take Dave's place. Down in the cave, John was already unconscious. He did not respond anymore. John was pronounced dead of cardiac arrest at 11.56 p.m. on November 25, 2009 by a paramedic who crawled into the cave. His wife, Emily, was terrified of leaving. What if he's not dead and we all leave and he wakes up and no one's there? But her husband, John, hadn't moved, spoken or breathed for hours. Rescuers had spent 27 hours trying to save John. Nutty Putty Cave lived up to its reputation on the night of John's death. From 1999 to 2004, six people became stuck in one of Nutty Putty's narrow tunnels but survived. Now sealed up, Nutty Putty Cave serves as a natural memorial and gravesite to John Edward Jones, since his body couldn't be removed. I quote, Because of where he is located in the cave and the danger involved in accessing that area, we have determined that the risk involved in removing John from the cave is too high," said Utah County Sheriff Sergeant Spencer Cannon. With that in mind, it has been decided that the cave will be permanently closed to all access. John's younger brother Josh offered a statement of gratitude to rescue workers. He said he knows some rescuers may feel they have failed the family, but family members know workers did everything they could to free their son, brother and husband. Afterwards, he formed a healing friendship with rescuer Susie Matola as they worked through their grief together. Emily Jones went home to Salem. On June 15th, their baby was born, and she named him John.